Um, so the budget today, the key number that came out from me is that our interest bill as a country is now 1 billion rand a day, which is 15 rand per day per, per person, not per taxpayer, per person. We finally crossed the billion rand a day in terms of interest. And there's some T's and C's there because of ESCOM, but still, it is uh, it's a terrifying number. There's no other way of putting it. Uh, so far, I want to start with you, because you're the, the business person on the panel, as opposed to politicians and tax people and journalists and the like. Well, was there anything in that budget for, for business? Uh, another tapered budget. Uh, so the one, when we spoke earlier, I said I'd give it a C. Um, just that the did the basics, and then a bit of a sprinkle. So I think the, the, the focus on, 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 on the energy rebate is, is, is considerable. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, one of the businesses that we run, we're now spending um, around 80,000 rands a month on diesel. Uh, so that gets you close to a million rands a year. Um, and, and so I mean, that's, that's quite small, but they are just feeling it. Uh, in a far more significant way. So that that was helpful. Um, but I think that was the only thing that, that stood out. Um, so so once again we we become imaginative in our problem solving when we reach crisis levels. Uh, but that was the one thing that I took from it and, and found some sort of comfort. Yeah, I, I want to come back to a degree to the growth part. We'll come back to that in a moment. Tony I expect a more of an election budget. I know we've got another budget before the election. Probably May next year we'll have the election. Probably around May Day, maybe. Um, but I thought maybe a bit more. Yeah, I look, uh, the best thing about the budget was the reaction of Kasatu, which uh, condemned the budget. Which <laughs> made me think that uh, Gordon Guana got something right. Um, the, you know, there's a famous joke told. Uh, uh, sorry, before I do that. Thank you very much. Um, but let me just say there was this great old joke told that the first law of economics is scarcity and it's real. And the first law of politics is to ignore the first law of economics. So you have to say, uh, you know, to God and God as credit or to National Treasury or both that they really didn't open up the spending taps beyond, obviously, the massive uh, debt increase and burden that now, as uh, Simon said. I mean, but the problem with the budget is its overall credibility framework. And, and I just found two incredible things in that budget from the uh, point of view of credibility or lack thereof. Number one, uh, and this is the blowout of the budget beyond the debt, is the public service wage bill. Yes. Now, last year, they said we're going to hold the line at 3.3%. There would be no increase beyond that, and it was when long negotiations started. The unions demanded 12%. Uh, and apparently they won't sit in less than six. Now, you talk about this is a, what you might call an interim year between the current government and the next government, which might not be the current government, we'll see. Uh, and the only remaining reliable pillar in the very fractured ANC alliance is the Kasatu pillar. They provide most of the election workers, they provide a lot of the funding for the ANC, and there are a lot of votes in the Kasatu affiliates. And Ramposa's election is almost entirely due, his re-election is present to Kasatu. So, do you think that 3.3% line is going to be held? I don't think so. Because I think the idea of an ANC government taking on the most powerful unions in the country uh, over the next year and then not succumbing is just defies everything that we know about the beast called the South African government to date. So the other problem I really had with the budget, and I, and I agree, look, I, I thought some of the stuff was inevitable, the 254 billion, ESCOM, well, it's not really a bailout, it's a take off the ESCOM balance sheet, the government balance sheet, some of us read them, I don't have to go into all the details and down all those rabbit holes, is at least an indication that it's not just going to be the same old, same old. So they put the strict conditionality, will they ever apply? Because to me, the figure that isn't in that 
budget speech, but is in the budget review, this fat book which is all the detail is hidden, is the fact that over the last decade, the last 10 years, 266 billion rand has been spent of your money uh, on bailing out state-owned companies. Now, there was a sort of vague thing in his speech, we're going to review certain, the, the centrality of some of these state companies, but I don't see any step change from the government doubling down on this ruinous policy, one of several that was used, and that is somehow the state should be front and center, not just of the development of this country, though you know, we don't have a running rail port or any other services of electricity, but actually this faith in these dinosaur state companies, which does a whole lot of negative things and very few positive things. So that, that to me, in the detail, not in the budget speech, but in the budget review, is very alarming. 266 million rand over 10 years, and practically every single one of those bailouts has failed. That, that is the material. Wanting to throw money is a problem. The much worse thing is to get nothing in return for money except, you know, the folk who stole it during what is called the nine wasted years. But actually, everyone in the current administration was part of those nine wasted years. So, you can join up the dots, as Mr. Prabhu Gordon said. And another billion for SAA. Now, don't get me wrong, I'm flying home on SAA this weekend, so they've got to last until Monday. But I'm using Voyager Miles, um, which somehow survived the bankruptcy. I, I, there was some magic there, but really, SAA, I thought they were in bankruptcy. I thought someone was buying them for 59 Rand or something, but uh, apparently not. Peter, for a tax person, I, I mean, I, I didn't see much work for you. Not really. Um, from a, from a, from a, you'll find it. Um, <laughs> you'll find it, you sure. But from a tax technical perspective, no. Um, this is probably the third or fourth budget that, um, from, a, from a technical, from a legislative point of view, um, very little in the budget. Uh, a couple of things uh, and around anti avoidance for distributions of trusts. Um, coronation was in the news now over the last couple of days around. Um, uh, Irish subsidiary of heirs and imputation of income, so refining of rules around that. Um, but a lot more focus on tax administration. Um, so rather on the, on the tax substance matter, looking at, um, looking at tax administration and tax compliance. And that's been a drive uh, under Commissioner Kiswetter for um, the last two or three years. Um, sometimes it's frustrating in practice, um, the, the approaches that SARS adopts, but at least they are doing something to clamp down on, on compliance. And very importantly, they, they started to use technology um, for that. And you can see that uh, the, they're trying to align the legislation with the techn technological advances they are. Third party reporting. Everybody that's filled in the uh, income tax return sees the information from employers being pulled indirectly. Over the last couple of years, we've seen information from legal aid, from banks, interest, all the rest. That's going to keep on expanding, keep on expanding. Um, and the other thing that they are looking at, from a, um, especially from a, um, from a VAT compliance system, is real-time reporting, real-time taxing. Um, so it's, it's encouraging that they are looking at technology solutions. But yes, in the budget itself, nothing much. Tony mentioned the big fat book in the background and that underpins it. And if you just read through the documentation, you can see that there's a, a strong, strong focus on administration rather than, um, rather than the, the substance. And I think that's, that's an indication of a tax system that is maturing. Our, our tax system is already overly complex. We have a, a first world tax system in a third world economy. We, we don't need technical changes anymore. We, we, the legislation is there, the rules are there, the law is there. We must just now go and apply it. And I think there's a shift towards complying and adherence to those rules rather than continuous making of new rules. Can I just add something, Simon, just on the tax side? Oh, listen, um, you know, it's great news for Ralph Baptist and AJM tax because uh, we're unfortunately about to be grey listed, as far as I can tell, on Friday, which means that whatever compliance you're dealing with now, it's just going to go, you know, through the roof. Yeah. And uh, some of the estimates on well, the FAT will make determination, they've already made it ready, they'll announce it on Friday. The same day, incidentally, you'll be doing. Uh, naval exercises with, with Russia. Russia off the coast of Kosovo Natal. So, this first anniversary of the Ukraine war, we, we might be grey listed and we'll be <laughs> in the red zone for other reasons. But, um, you know, that is a pretty scary thought because, um, although it will, if you're in the regulatory sphere and companies around it, it's going to be very good for business. But for the rest of us, you know, companies, individuals, just trying to do any transaction uh, outside this jurisdiction is, is going to just be burdensome. 
And, you know, I, I was listening to the God and God, and I thought to myself, you know, as you talk to some of the tax measures, we only have 7.9 million individual taxpayers in this yes. country. We've got about 28 million people receiving uh, social grants, so there's a huge imbalance. And I thought to myself, you know, if you have to do anything for your taxes in Albertus' office and his office, I really demand it on behalf of SARS. But the one thing that struck me is we, it's like living in Switzerland. We're all this here in the wonderful hills of Durbanville. You're in the Swiss part of South Africa. The rest of South Africa is like Guatemala, where I know about Latin America. It's, it's almost completely lawless. I mean, mafia uh, enterprises take over construction sites. You know what Dorator said about the criminal syndicates in ESCOM. And so there's this disconnect between, as Peter said, you know, it's pretty first world. It was a sophisticated approach. National Treasury is still pretty technically uh, competent. The Reserve Bank is very good. But this really only deals with a small section of what you might call the broader South Africa. Because the rest of it, it's like the badlands and you're on your own. Tony, that, that's actually the one thing you mentioned across border transactions or uh, international, um, international uh, dealings. For me, that's the one thing that is still lacking. We've, um, since 2018, 2019, we've, um, they've talked about exchange control reform, um, a capital flow management system, which is a lot easier, opening up the borders. We haven't seen that. There's still nothing around exchange controls, just these vague statements that they are looking at, uh, at implementing. But, but SARS as an institution and the Reserve Bank as a different one are staring at each other and neither party knows where we must go and what the policy decision should be. Um, exchange controls are 100 years old in South Africa and it's putting, it, it's put, putting the handbrake on economic growth. Um, so it's, that, was, that was one thing that I, that I really hoped was going to be addressed here. Of course we've been promised it for the last three, four, five years, but still nothing on exchange control. And, and that was a lot not said. I mean what struck out for me was lack of any assistance for savers and investors. No change to tax free. Uh, no change to the Reg 28 two pot system kicked down the road for another year. We knew that was going to happen. Um, no change to contribution deductions to Reg 28. Your half a million tax free you can take out now kicked up to 550,000. But a, a, almost an empty budget. Although, uh, uh, Peter, I want to come back to you. You mentioned SARS. What we saw, and we can see it, the numbers coming through, the captured SARS of the previous uh, administration has been uncaptured. Yes, definitely. Um, there's, been a, there's been a significant drive in um, getting good, quality, educated people in the right areas. Um, unfortunately, three, four, five, six years is not going to be enough to turn that ship around. Um, but we are seeing really clever appointments um, at, at high levels within SARS. Um, making use of, I mentioned technology earlier. So yes, the, 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 the top management structures in SARS, they have the right people there. It just unfortunately takes time. Um, so I think um, Commissioner Kiesbeter and whoever his, um, his follow-up might be, um, and I don't think it's too long before, uh, before he's, he's set to retire, and I, and I hope we have, have, a, have a decent appointment there. Um, but there, there is still some work to be done, uh, but we're definitely moving in the right direction. Your experience on, on, on SARS, I mean, I, you're not the, the CFO person, so you're not at, at the coal front, but you have businesses, and, you know, I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I recently started up into PTY, or formed a PTY, and it was the most amazing experience. I long, logged onto the CIPC website, and 30 minutes later, I had a PTY, I had a tax number, I, had a, uh, I didn't have a bank account. The bank took two weeks, um, but the process was, was all online, completely smooth, and, and frankly, was a little bit alarming almost because it was the last thing I expected. As a business, I mean, the red tape is, 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 is real. I think we've gotten so used to shopping levels in the public yeah. that, that when, when, when things happen as they should, it's almost like you've experienced a biblical miracle, right? Uh, but, 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 but SARS, I think, uh, um, to the shock of many, myself included, has become incredibly uh, uh, competent in collecting. Um, uh, I've got a very polite call to say, hey, what's happening? Um, so, so I think that, like you were saying earlier, that, that is very clear. Um, I think you know, whether you engage with, with uh, SIPC as well, you see uh, <coughs> great competence there. Uh, what, what I think needs to happen is once in a while, some bright people are given space to do things. So um, I'll, I'll keep on talking about Second 12J for 
for forever uh, because uh, you know, you know, we, we run a hospitality business that was a direct beneficiary of 12J um, and was, you know, the tap, that tap was closed purely because there were a few bad apples in, 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 in that barrel. But uh, what, what you wish you could see is a lot more of that dynamic thinking in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the SARS treasury interacting with, with the business world. Um, and that, that should be, a, you know, we're now going to, I guess, the, 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 the next phase, which is uh, you know, energy rebates and energy incentives. Um, and, and, and we want them to start thinking about the next issues. Because you know, energy today uh, is logistics. It's water. Uh, it's water. Uh, and, and so what you don't want is a reactive response to these, to these challenges. Um, come to the business world as early as possible as you see that you as a state are unable to deliver and don't wait for things to completely collapse before you, 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 know, you, wipe, you, you wave your white flag. Do it now. Um, so it was a budget that lacked growth. I mean, I, 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 I read it. I mean, I downloaded it and read it and then I read it the second time because I thought I was missing things. Imagination. Imagine, there's nothing there, aside from the fact that the minister uh, has a GDP target which is three times more than the Reserve Bank. Um, and, and, you know, it, it just, it, it, there was no, and I'm not even saying necessarily bold ideas, but, but just, you know, where's our growth coming from? Where are we going to get back to your days in Parliament where we were doing 5% and then truthfully berating the President and the Finance Minister because it was only 5 So, so, so I, I often... And I, and I apologize for offending you. I often think of engagement with between state and business as a courtship, as a marriage. You know, so if you are a husband and you have a wife who complains that you, you, know, you get home at two o'clock on a Saturday after knocking off at five on a Friday, that's not the only problem, right? Uh, <laughs> there are other problems that inform the fact that you're doing that. But what the state does is that it then says, okay. You complain about the fact that I come home at two, so now I'm going to get home at nine, and therefore problem solved. So, so, so it's like a very silo approach to problem fixing. There's, there's energy is a big problem because you know it's hard to run an economy in the dark. So now all the focus goes to that, and, and in his speech he literally says, lack of energy is an impediment to the growth of the economy. Yes, well done. But lack of safety and security is an impediment to the economy. Lack of uh, infrastructure is, is, is an impediment. How do you deal with that? So, so what they're going to do is that they'll wait for that to get to the crisis level, and then... Responsive rather than... Yeah. Well, no, if I could just say something, I think you're absolutely correct. Uh, you know, in this, I always say this, and it's not... Well, I was, I'm so old, I was, my first day of problems was FW declared. <laughs> made his famous speech on the 2nd of February 1990. You know, kind of, there I was, uh, you know, from a, the constituency of Houghton, and, and suddenly the liberal, most liberal area of South Africa, and suddenly the Conservative Nationalist Prime Minister, President, should I say, has taken our entire manifesto and <laughs> jumped 46 years of National Party policy in one 40-minute speech, and we live with the consequences of that very bold decision here and now, for better and for worse. But that, you know, doing a declare is, is very rare. It's why people like Leclerc and Gorbachev are remembered for, for changing step. You know, one, you can't really object to very much what God and Guana said today on the National Treasury supporting documents. If you, if you just simply rearrange the financial envelope as he's done and give a few concessions here and a, a couple of incentives over there, without changing the overall architecture underpinning architecture, it's all, a, it's all a fool's errand, in my view, because the underlying policy choices that have been made over the last several years have put us in the terrible predicament that we're in right now as a country and the fiscus faces. And now, there's a list. We could start with paid a deployment. The ANC's in court at the moment, fighting the opposition's decision to call it off. We can talk about, which is allied to that, appointments made on merit. You know, I absolutely take the point about SARS and its improvement. But that's because they make meritorious appointments. Yeah. But it's one of the very few areas of government that they do. I don't know if any of you guys, we're talking about it just informally before we start, I don't know if any of you guys here 
uh, what should happen. Absurdity. I don't know if it's actually might not happen or not. With the Tottenham Hotspur deal for a billion rand of your hard-earned money to go, you know, North England, which incidentally the fantastic thing is one of the many nicknames of the Spurs is the Lily, Lily Whites. I thought the years ago, <laughs> rand of your money behind the team known as the Lily Whites. But anyway, or Yitz Army, it's even worse. It gets better and better in our anti-Israel activities at the moment. But the thing is, you know, three very upstanding uh, tourism savvy board members resigned because of that. And they've been replaced. And now there are 10 members. They all earn, you know, good salaries, good monuments, the usual thing. On the SA Tourism Board, none of, not one of whom has a background in tourism or an expertise, as opposed to my fellow panelist on the far left. He, uh, Geographically, not ideologically. <laughs> but so, you know, I'm saying an issue can you jump that whole apparatus? It's not going to change. And, and I don't see the, the problem to me, the problem is at the top. The, you know, I know one thing, Cyril is a business friend, he really is a doctor. But you think he is, and that's why people like him. He's got a very nice manner, which he does have. Is you've got a very bad GP, doctor and he gives you a terrible diagnosis, you've got a charming bedside manner, you might want to go to a doctor with a very bad manner, but who has a very good diagnostic skills. So as is the bad GP with a wonderful bedside manner. But the thing is, he said it at the height of COVID. It's there, and that is the essential problem for all our other problems with the budget system manifestation. He said, I would rather be remembered as a weak president than the president who presided over the disunity of the ANC. And you cannot unite those factions and govern this country in a pro-growth way. You must, it's, a, it's a choice. It's what they call in, you know, in, the, in the old days a catch-22. Escape is improbable from the situation because the contradictions built within the contradict. That's it. So either you're going to have the reforms, the real macro reforms that are needed to get this country going again, you're going to have a division of the ANC. You're going to keep the ANC united, you're not going to get the reforms. That's, I think, maybe I'm, I hope I'm wrong. There is one, if I'm sorry, I'm going to be dominant as well. I haven't been in Parliament a long time, so I enjoy these platforms. <laughs> uh, just one thought that I want to make you feel a bit better about this. There's a unit in the presidency called Operation Villa Yeah. 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 Which is meant to, you know, cut red tape all the nonsense. You, know, you think it's all rubbish, and you probably argue as well, except. I don't want to, you know, compromise my sources there, say, the smart I was with a fairly, fairly senior person, not in the government sector, but from the private sector, who's been called into the energy work stream. In other words, they're going to try and unlock the civil declared state of emergency. That's all performance rubbish. We're not going to have another minister. It's just that nonsense. And my interlocutor was told, basically, by the DG or someone very close to DG in the presidency, look, Nothing is off the table. Absolutely nothing. Whatever you suggest, if it has a flying chance, we take it. That was basically it. And I saw that in another instance, which is in the public domain. And that is because of the disaster at Transnet and the ports, which I don't have to elaborate on, or you will press fingers. They have decided basically to commercialize, reprivatize, really two of the largest container ports in the country, the Durban one, and the one near PE. Um, and here's the thing, and they've, they've got international companies bidding that are in the final window, I think eight of the companies are international. They made them, <coughs> compliance levels had to be with international experience, so none of the local suspects, the Guptas couldn't suddenly, you know, float a poor company. You had to have international credential then. And they removed all BEE requirements from that particular team. Now, I'm not saying, I'm not here to have a debate about the merits, demerits of BE, but what I'm saying is, because the situation is so desperate, because, you know, Kumba lost 10 billion rand last year, so, you know, Platinum Company, because they, oh, Iron Company, because they couldn't get the goods to market, and you know, 55 billion overall lost by mining groups, they now want to make a change. And all the kind of orthodoxies, or some of those orthodoxies, are being behind hidden hand and shut the foot, pushed to one side. But that we need actually a wholesale uh, bonfire there. Yeah, and, and a more recent announcement is they're going to 
again reprivatize the Durban Gauteng train line because I mean we, we stayed in the Midlands a while ago and the train line's right there and I'm like oh it's going to be terrible there's going to be a train every two minutes now there's two a day um, and, and they're all on the road instead I want to bring it Peter back to you back to some, some logistics and that's solar so I had thought the easy win was zero rate the VAT on, on everything, inverters, etc., etc. Just because we've got experience with it, it's simpler to do. The idea is so business can deduct 125% in the cost of wind, solar, hydro, biomass, etc. in the first year. Logistically, is that a nightmare or is that actually not such a, a, a complex problem? For businesses, not so much. Um, there's already, it's established, uh, Section 12, capital B of the Income Tax Act already makes provision for yeah. uh, for similar type of deductions. So the business is, uh, for, for business entities, it's very much uh, a compliance as usual and I don't see too much issues for them. Um, the, what I think we, we, we missed an opportunity, and it just goes back to the lack of ingenuity that, that you spoke about, is the um, allowance that they've made for, for residents now, for, yeah. for households. I think we, we, we missed the ticket there. Firstly, um, so it's 25 percent. So 25 percent of the cost of a new solar PV panel. Be clear, panel, not the construction, not the inverter, not the band battery. Uh, capped at 15,000 so. so. So what they're doing there is it almost as if um, last week after the state of the nation, where Cyril oh. mentioned there's going to be some incentive. Treasuries. They, they rush into it, but we must put something together. It, it's, it's not well um, thought through because. Firstly, they, they, um, the, the mechanism is going to be an, um, a, an allowance, not a deduction. Um, and particularly, you, you rewarding people that have already installed this. What we want to do is create capacity. You want to be able to fund people to go ahead and do that, to become less dependent on government. So that's not, that's not what's going to happen. You're only going to get your, your rebate 18 months um, after you've installed it. And then you're just rewarding the costs that you've already incurred. You're not putting people in a position through zero rating, through the reduction of import duties, um, through an immediate uh, uh, subsidy of actually financing the, the thing. The people that have already installed it and are going to, they have the ability to do it and they're just getting a thumbs up later on. You're not creating the capability for people that don't have that capacity to get the panels, get what they need and fund it now to make some, themselves self-sufficient. And, and they, there was opportunity around that. Um, and, and we missed that, unfortunately, because it's, I think it was hastily put together and not well put through. I'm sure you're right. The one thing that did, just to follow on, I think that a lot of these so-called reforms are done you know, in a hidden way behind the shop of foot and so on. The solar panels are very interesting, because you'll recall, uh, until very recently, you, they had a localization report. Yes. And they discovered, hang on, there's no local we don't make them. producer of solar panels anywhere in the country. So they had this thing you could but no one could get them and then they just carried them out of existence for overseas. That's been scrapped. That was Minister Patel, no doubt. Yeah, of course. <laughs> but, but what I'm saying is, you know, it, as you peer over the edge when you start going over it, suddenly there is a degree, I, I don't want to sound like Pollyanna here, of pulling back and saying, well, hang on, we can't go on like this because then we are going to be in trouble. And but, uh, as Director said, the, the real trouble is the next election. He said that last night in his TV interview. That's what terrifies the government. I just wish it would terrify me every day, not on the eve of the election. And, and that perhaps is the point, because I mean, as business, I mean, you, you want change, but at the same time, you you, you need some level of certainty. You, you you've got a business. You 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 know you you bringing together funders and you are bringing together expertise and you you're running a business plan, which is you know three, five, and ten year plans, etc. So so the government has a tricky line to walk. Although truthfully, they seem to take the lazy line. I, I think for the longest time, the the, the NC government has had has, has had a very romanticized notion of its role in society. Yeah. Um, it imagines itself as this uh, paternalistic entity that looks after us as its children. It's like it, it's, that's how it imagines it. Without it, we wouldn't survive. Yeah. Um, and so you, you, you hear in this tagline, the NC lives, the NC leads. So by the virtue of just purely existing, it is a leader. Um, and for as long as it exists, and South Africa exists, it imagines that um, it will be the leader of society. Um, and so I think what's happening now is the, a real recognition of how difficult it is to run an incredibly complicated plan like that. 
the, the sales pitch has run its course. Um, so what, what Tony's talking about with is like now real pragmatic thinking about what it takes to, to get things right. Um, and you know, for the first time in a long time, there's a need to talk about what the state is actually capable of doing. Um, and a real you know, introspection about the role of the state. That's an important point, and this is what we talked when we were, when we were prepping a few weeks ago, which is where does the, 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 the role of the state, and, and, and let's be clear to your earlier point, is that the ANC does very much view it as this, this, is, this is our state almost in a sense, and they are the grandfather of the, of, 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 of the, of the collective. And, and, and for me what's unfortunate is that I don't think anybody in the business world imagined that the ANC would or should or could do all of these things that it says it wants to do or should, yeah. said it needed to do. There's always been a willingness from, 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 from the private sector to be a partner. Um, but, but I think, you know, as they see it, having a partner means that you're not competent. So this, this idea that you are all seeing, all knowing, all doing um, fades when you say, I actually need help. Uh, but, but you know, this government, this political party, which has been in power for since '94, is the first government, and I keep reminding people, that has had as its obligation to look after 100% of the population, right? Um, and with competing agendas, um, you know, Switzerland and Guatemala, it's hard enough to run a Guatemala, and now there's a Switzerland, it's hard enough to run a Switzerland. So, so, so we, are, we are a country with very uh, complex problems. And for them to have imagined that they could have the way with all to resolve all our problems is incredibly arrogant or amazingly naive. <laughs> or bits of both. So, so two good pieces that came out of the budget. Uh, they adjusted the, the tax brackets uh, for inflation. So that, uh, in theory, if we got inflation-adjusted salary increases, uh, we won't be paying more tax there. And we got an overrun of 93.7 billion uh, tax revenue than had been anticipated. Tony, I'll take you to a flashback to the last time we had a commodity boom, which was the early 2000s, where you were, well, you had front row seat as the leader of the opposition. Minister Manuel would stand up with his aloes and the like and, and uh, uh, actually give us tax cuts proper cuts, I mean the real McCoy, um, I mean, it must have been difficult being in opposition because I mean, there, there were things we could object to, but at least thing, I mean, we had a windfall. We're making this money because commodity prices are higher. Even, of course now our ports don't work and our railways don't work, so we can't get as much to market. It's not just Kumba, it's Bungela, it's Anglo Platinum, it's all of them. Um, but I mean, there, there have been times when, when, when we were really as I said, 5% growth with, uh, with Mboweni, Manuel, and of course Mbeki at the top. Uh, absolutely. And look, I mean, in those, you know, golden days we now see in the early 2000s, uh, the Manuel used part of that uh, surplus uh, through the commodities boom to bring down, uh, you know, the GDP yeah. uh, debt ratio to about 22% of GDP. Which was then the, one of the lowest in the world. Yes, yeah, so we're now at 76 or 77 percent, and that's actually regarded as relief because it could have been higher. So, you know, Kate Kool Aid wants to know, as they say. Look, you know, without beating the same tin drum to an earlier point I made, what, you know, Becky, you know, let's not get all nostalgic, but in many ways, you know, he. 300,000 people died in this country. I was going to say HIV. Because he was basically, he knew better that, that about HIV not causing AIDS in this week. But he was economically, he was half brain there. So he put forward a whole package of economic reforms which really would have got the state out of the way, brought in the private sector, been a hard privatization of these inessential state assets. He enraged Kasaji and the Communist Party, and he pulled back. And one of the reasons he lost his presidency, because he was, you know, cosseted Mugabe or was, you know, an AIDS denialist, it was because Kasaji and the commies said, this chap is not one of us. But he didn't use 
the space and the powers that he had to actually drive the reform agenda. He was a, he was a bit, and this is a very bad analogy, but he owed me to yourself at the time. He was a bit like P.V. Buerta politically was. P.V. Buerta couldn't see it through. He started a reform process and then stopped, you know, the papacy on the banks of the Rubicon. But de Klerk, you know, crossed that Rubicon and saw it through. In Becky identified everything that needed to be done to change the economic dynamics here, but then lacked the political courage to drive it through. And, but he landed up in the worst both worlds. He actually lost his presidency as well. So, you know, I completely agree. From a fiscal, financial, budgetary point of view, using the surplus with But they had the space, they had the power. I mean, when Mbeki was the president of South Africa, maybe because I was leading the opposition, the ANC got 68% of the votes in the 2004 mm. election. Well, now, among ANC supporters, not, you know, not the usual suspects living in the northern suburbs of Cape Town, but among ANC supporters, Ramaphosa's approval rate is only 48%. We think he's doing a good job. This is my ANC. So, because when you, you know, when you, when you deteriorate, everyone starts to, it has a return address at some point. Even among people, it might have been propagandized, or, and, and the faith, the, the gratitude people feel for, say, the liberation, does not, wears out after 29 years, for obvious reasons. So you mentioned how um, surplus is being pushed back into the, um, into the debt uh, driving in this afternoon that, uh, um, uh, on the radio uh, show we interviewed a couple of grade one and two mm -hmm. learners um, all about saving and money and valentines and all sorts of random questions. And they asked this one little, um, one little boy, but how do, you, how do you save money? And his answer was just simply, well, you save money by not spending a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and it's... I think there's, there's some irony in that. You, know, you save money by not spending a lot of money. And, and it, it's very true to what, what we see today, Tottenham Hotspur and everything else. So we potentially have the capacity to have a surplus, but we're just not saving it because we're spending it. I, I, uh, Peter, I want to start with you. I've got two questions. One I'm going to throw to you, and I have no idea because this is going to come at you completely left field. So if you dodge, that's fine. Coronation appealing, taking it to Concord. Is that more about setting president, or is it about saving 900 million? No, I think it's going to be more about saving 900 million. Um, the coronation judge... And I ask as a shareholder, yeah. you got smacked in the face. <laughs> I finished buying my coronation shares at about half past 11 on Wednesday morning, <laughs> and at about 20 past 1, they were 10% lower. So you're uh, a good stock picker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Follow me for more hot tips. <laughs> <laughs> I, think it's a, I think it's a money question, it's not a legal question. If you, um, if you look at the, um, at the basis on which the Supreme Court of Appeal found in SARS's favour, um, it's a factual question only. Yeah. Um, the, okay. the, the interpretation of the law, interpretation of the act, I think SARS and coronation are, are pretty um, equal on, listen, and agree on how the law must be interpreted. It's facts. How do we fit coronation specific factual circumstances in that legislative framework? And that's why I'm there. Slightly concerned that um, when they do want to appeal to the Constitutional Court, that the Supreme Court of Appeal is not going to allow them um, yes. to leave to appeal, and that the Constitutional Court might say, listen, this is a factual question, there's no legal question to be answered, we're denying leave to appeal. Uh, that's my thing, it's that's, a factual, this is not a legal so question. I'm so. slightly concerned for their position, but no, I, I think it's, if they do appeal and they get leave, um, it's going to be about the, the close one of the Okay, so I'm not getting a dividend, is what you're saying. I'm, no. not, I'm, not, I'm, not. I'm going to open to the floor for a question. I've got a last question for each of the panel, and this is the really hard question. I'm going to start with you, Lisekho. If you were Finance Minister tomorrow, we'd take you down to well, not Parliament, City Hall, um, and let you, what would be the, the one thing that would be top and centre of your, of your agenda? Hmm. <laughs> I, I, I think, uh, you know, we spoke about the fact that there were no, uh, you know, they, they, tread, they were treading very lightly in terms of yes. the increase of uh, tax obligations. It's, it speaks to the fact that they understand that we are not too far off in the tax result, um, in whatever way. Um, the, there's a lack of faith and... Uh, in, the trust deficit, yeah, the giant trust deficit. The function of the state. So I would, I would look at the entire economy and find opportunities across that spectrum 
where I could develop that trust? You know, where can I create incentives? Where can I create opportunities for, uh, for, for money go, to go into particular sectors? Um, we now know that we've got a, a, a receiver that is, that is functioning and so it's able to collect. It gives us a bit of breathing space. So let's find a way to re-engage and rebuild that trust. I'm going to go back to it because I, like I said, I'm a beneficiary of it. Find five key industries. Um, you know, we speak of infrastructure and logistics. We speak of tourism, big uh, job creator. Uh, and, and go up education and the challenges in that space. And find ways to incentivize uh, the private sector to invest in those. Uh, and find what works yeah. and focus on that and, yeah. and, and make them work better. Find what works and use those as case studies and say this is, this is what it looks, it looks like when it works. We spoke earlier about 12J incentive that had a travel commuter had land, yeah, yeah. Uh, partnered with a fund, built a launch which now employs uh, you know, members of that community. That's a great case study. Uh, let's find 20, 30 other communities that can do that. Yeah. In a community that I think had an unemployment rate of 100, uh, no work at all. Yeah. Yeah. You would be way more technical. Peter, what would be, I mean, top of your list? Um, I would, perhaps not from a budgetary perspective, mm. but I, I would have used influence to, that, that we, we get legislation in South Africa to break down the, the silos that we're operating in. National Treasury, uh, well, there's, there's government that yeah. has policy. National Treasury um, makes the laws. They, they, they uh, through Parliament, um, enact the legislation. SARS has to administer and position this, then you have tax practitioner bodies, and then you have the taxpayer. And, and then the Reserve Bank also is sitting. And all of them operate in silos. Um, sometimes I, I don't often say this, but sometimes I feel sorry for SARS, um, because they are, they are the ones that must administer, administer this piece of legislation that's been built on some ideological um, set of circumstances, and um, the administration is pushed to them, not, they don't know how it works out in practice, what must yeah. be done, how it will be integrated. So we, we need something that breaks down those barriers that can create, uh, we don't need uh, another forums, please not, um, and meetings about meetings, we, we don't need that, but practical solutions that all of these um, decision makers and policy makers can on equal footing sit down and discuss the issues. Tony? Well, I have the advantage of being a la second last, so uh, if you don't think about it, because I, what, my first thought is the Minister of Finance actually doesn't have that much power. He has a sense that he's the spender and, and, the, and Dr. No when it comes to those who want to spend. But the policies all have to be determined by his party and his press. So actually most of the change in would have, should have been announced in the Sona, of course they weren't, because that's not Cyril's staff. So what can the Minister of Finance actually do? Well, he can affect the tax regime and maybe he's gone as far as he could. But he could send a signal that he's in his power. He can't abolish the data and companies, that's another minister. He can't amend the labor laws, that's another minister. What he could do, a very simple thing, is to abolish exchange control, for example. We were talking about that earlier. Because it's actually probably revenue neutral. Money will leave, but money will come in. But it actually sends a very strong signal of confidence. And the second thing it does, it actually says, well, we don't just talk about an open business we are, and we're going to show you how we are. And I think, you know, because he has that power, that he doesn't need the permission slip of the president yeah. or the minister of state enterprise. So that's what I would do. Yeah, and it is it's that it's the, it, it's the sense of confidence. Yeah. We are so confident that you take your money if you want, but you're going to want to bring it back. Questions from the floor. We have microphones and we have a microphone carrier. Uh, anybody, somebody? I'm so, um, asking for a friend because I might be wrong on numbers or all. <laughs> um, so small businesses, a two-pronged question, um, the, the VAT level, where they must start paying VAT, how long ago has that been adjusted? I think it's been a million, it's around a million rand, and we'll for a small forever. business, it's, it's a tremendous thing to start your legalization around VAT and so on. How long ago has that been adjusted? to assist small businesses to, to start doing or to make business easier. And then second question is, how many people around that mark and just over does the, the VAT or 
do pay that um, or do the legalization around that? So, so what your name? I'm Mr. Name. Dower. Uh, I, I, have the, I have this exact discussion with, um, with uh, two people yesterday. Um, I'm really mad level, and I'm speaking on the correction. Then it, maybe you can you look at uh, uh, 20 plus years. That it can, yeah. it's, it's too low. It's, it's simply too low. Uh, my, I can't base it on anything, but my sense is that it must be around 5 to 10 million rand somewhere. That's where the level uh, must be, because the two conversations that I have had um, are between people that just below or just over. Now they're starting to think of all clever little things and be splitting things with separate companies. Or, so they're actively trying to, to um, avoid a system. And I understand the reason, because it makes them completely uncompetitive. It's small business. Um, that's volume driven, the margins are already paper thin, and now it's this initial 15%. That, so, so, absolutely, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's, it, 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 I think that, that um, the level where the registration is now um, is killing small business. Absolutely, I couldn't yeah. agree more. And it is a long time, because I remember a business was a CC, it was probably in the early 2000s. And a million a year, I mean, if I could get to that, I was a baller man. I was drinking, you know, 20 year old wine every night. Now at a million, I'm drinking box wine. I mean, it, it <laughs> question here, up in front. Peter, so this is a question for you with regards to the reference to the spending. And, and a comment that I heard was that um, we do have the revenue, but the problem is the spending. Now, is the problem that we're spending too much, or are we actually spending? on the wrong things. I think it's a combination. Um, I think if we, if we not, we're not, where we are spending, we're not getting bang for above. Why do we need a minister of electricity? So that's going to be additional spend. They all, we really have to make that. There we go. 27 million. 37. Yeah. So, so we, we, we're spending on the wrong places. We're not getting bang for above. We're not getting profitably. We're not, we're not leading every rand for the, possible, for the, for the capability that that rand has. Yeah, yeah. PAs, uh, DGs. We're looking at budget surplus at some stage, and that's the reason why I think there might be some, um, some surplus somewhere. Is if we are looking at a budget surplus, take that and apply it towards the debt. So if we just if we um, reconsider the spending and ensure that we're getting bang for the local government, get rid of that, um, then we might end up in a certain situation. Where we just simply, we, we, um, we're not saying what we're spending. Quick on the ESCOM, we brushed over a debt relief of 168 billion, but let's be clear, uh, government was guaranteeing the debt mostly anyway. Um, and, uh, and that's in capital repayments and then 86 billion in interest, which the current debt's what, 400 odd, so call that taking it down to 200 odd. Um, doesn't save ESCOM. <coughs> I, I, ESCOM's problem is that they can't make electricity. Uh, we currently, I mean, their the generation capacity is just not there. Uh, the money is a horror story, but I, the answer is claim your 15,000 rand and uh, put solar. Uh, any more questions coming through from the floor? Yes, Chris Hart. Uh, sorry, one there, I'll come to you in a sec. Um, I'm Dion. Peter, question for you. With regarding to um, trust distributions, is it only with regards to distribution to non-residents the changes, or were there others? Dion, at this stage, um, it look, <coughs> how the system works currently is that um, South African re 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 resident trusts um, can distribute, uh, not allowed to distribute capital gains to non-residents. They are still allowed to distribute normal income, interest, or rental income, whatever that might be, um, to non-residents. Exchange control, getting the money to those non-residents is a, a totally separate question. But on a tax technical um, point, capital gains are blocked and taxed in the trust where income distributions are currently allowed. And that's exactly, there was a judgment in October, November last year, the fiscal trust um, judgment where they tried to, um, tried to uh, address this. Um, but now there's the, the mechanism, it looks to be that they're going to block any distributions to non-residents. So everything will be caught up in the, um, in the or tax in, in South Africa. You'll still be able, you'll still be able on a, to make the, make the distribution, but the tax consequences will accrue to the, uh, will accrue to the tax. <coughs> I think we are fortunate, and some jurisdictions are looking at where we have um, companies declaring dividends, so a company that distributes money to shareholders, it's a dividend so that they might want to start treating tax similarly, that accrued funds that trusts the tribute are treated similarly to dividends, and that there's a withholding tax that applies to that. We're fortunate that they were not quite there yet, um, and it's just the distribution to non residents that they're looking at at this stage. But we'll see in July when the concept, um, concept of this actually gets put forward.
Another hit to savers was no change to the interest exemption, um, which has remained unchanged since the 2015 budget, when uh, then Finance Minister Nkankla Nene, and he has a fun trick, name every minister since Nkankla Nene to date. <laughs> So Des, uh, 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 Gordon again, uh, uh, no, there was someone before Mbweni, yeah, yikes are no use. Um, the trick is quite simple, is government has said we're giving you the tax-free saving, so we don't need to change that number. Um, and so if, you, if you're looking for interest income, then it needs to be done in a tax-free. Of course, there are challenges there because of annual limits, you can't just put the money in and the rest. Chris, you had a question? I just want to go back to what Tony was saying. Debt to GDP ratio, 77%, but this budget clearly is taking the parasitical debt and making it government debt. And when you add that, then what, what is the number? And then the question is, our debt um, in terms of interest rate, which is closer to 100% of GDP, mm. is not the, the same as 100% in Germany because of the lip the difference in interest rate that we have to pay. How close are we to an IMF, uh, uh, the need for an IMF uh, little visit? Yeah, I, I think that amount is actually, uh, it's, it's, it's all in. I mean, I, I assume you wouldn't have mentioned that percentage in the speech if he wasn't including the debt he was just taking onto the fiscal balance sheet uh, from ESCOM. But uh, it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's over several years, so it will probably adjust upwards. I think it will adjust upwards. And there's ESCOM debt that's not coming, which truthfully is government liability. Yes, so we, well, I mean, you know, you can answer as much better than I can. But uh, you know, we, you get into a debt, you get into a debt trap spiral when your cost of your interest plus your principal becomes unpayable, and it just crowds out everything else. Then you do have to go and get a bailout. Well, we of course have been to the IMF for a little bailout, but we didn't talk about that much during COVID. So, the, and despite the, all the stuff about sovereign surrender, I don't see, Chris, uh, if we carry on down the path of unsustainability, which we're on, that they're going to have any options. But who knows? Isn't what's saving us, Chris, is that our debt is mostly Zard nominated? I.e., we're not to uh, because because we can we can print our way out of it, and I know what that means. But but we can just turn the printing press on. Yeah, specifically lean on foreign debt to uh, yes. to do it, and I think the the other problem is is that the uh, yield curve is not that favourable for for taking a longer longer term debt. As uh, I mean, most of them have inverted for the US and um, and Germany and Japan and that type of thing. So. The difficult that they can finance themselves still pretty cheaply on the long term basis, but South Africa is sitting on a much higher. Yeah, I mean, Japan at 200% debt to GDP when your interest rate is negative, yeah, it's manageable. Yes, and that's the difficult job. More questions coming, or do we hit the bar? Can I ask one for a tax thing. Yes. You've got Section 12B, there's quite a lot of liberalisation mm. with that. For individuals to claim 12B, can they do claim 12B and this new incentive that they can yeah, I, do? I can't see any prohibition on that. The yeah. um, 12B is um, something totally separate. There's, um, the residential component is going to be entirely new um, portion, so I don't think that will be any yeah. prohibition. But you can, um, if it's the same unit, same building that you use, I'm not quite sure whether they're going to address that. Um, so I, I think there will be mechanisms that you don't double that in, in both provisions. Um, but it won't be excluded on the residential And a lot of the 12B for individuals will be via funds, yeah. much as the 12Js were. Yeah. yeah. Uh, another question in the front here. Okay, this is very hypothetical, and I should actually ask this next year this time. Um, or, in, yeah, next year. Um, if we get a, say now we go to the polls and we get a, the ANC is voted out, um, who would you um, prefer if, it's a big if, um, who would you give the finance minister job to? I'd like to go first. <laughs> hey, a man with an answer, I love it. I was listening to you, you know, whether it was Tony or Chris, and we, we, we were sort of as if it was a foregone conclusion that comes the election next year, we were, 
you know, still continue the AC majority government. And I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. Um, the makeup of what will become a national coalition government will be interesting. Um, my wish is that for the next 12 months or whatever, however long it takes for national election, DA uh, leadership just shuts up for 10 months. Don't fight in public. Uh, don't kick out young people out of their party so that they can go and get the black vote that is waiting for them. So don't offend anybody. Don't say anything. Get off Twitter. Uh, and <laughs> and if, 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 if they do that, um, and I hope that there's you know, funds that and resources are going to actually SA, uh, going to Livonia Circle led by some years ago, um, which is new uh, party, which is a better name than those one that we call. Um, that is potentially my wish, my you know, nirvana, is the, the black opposition bloc that formed a coalition with a DA and an NC some way there. Where is the EFF? <laughs> so, so, so if the DA keeps quiet for the next 10 months, <laughs> 14 months, there is no EFF. Yeah, but, but if not, the, the, the coalition party will have the EFF. And, and then it's for Chibanko. Yeah, and then... then yeah. yeah, that's the worst outcome, is the EFF and the ANC. That is even worse than the e ANC on their own, in my view. Although there are EFF types in the ANC at the moment. Yeah, yeah, you haven't answered the question. So, so Lesefo, who would be your finance minister? Hmm. Mm. What well, I'm thinking, I'll, I'll, I'll come back to you. But I'll I'll, to go back to you know, the days of Trevor Manuel, who we romanticized earlier, Trevor Manuel, apart from having you know, a lot of self confidence, uh, he wasn't financially gifted, he, was, mm. uh, he wasn't even trained. Uh, but he was competent and intelligent, but those were not the primary factors that made him a good finance minister. But he had the backing of the president. So if you were to say to me uh, who it's going to be, just let's de-individuate it and say, will the finance minister have the backing of a reform-minded president? Because if he has that, he can basically do a great number of things that all of us in the room would think this will drive growth, this will bring our taxes down, bring uh, you know, jobs up, all the good things that I think across the board people want. Um, on, on the composition of the coalition, well that's going to be complicated, but the fact that we've been having, I agree with you, this discussion uh, is, is actually healthy in a way, because it means that the ANC does not go to continue to have a monopoly of power, but it can fragment in a way that can also be quite critical. Michael Dong. Or Sim Shabalala from Standard Bank? So Sim Shabalala was my guest. Well, my, and that's because he was once my boss. And when I say boss, I mean between me and him there were 500 layers of corporate <laughs> higgledy piggledy. But, uh, and he wasn't the boss back then either. He was running, running Standard Bank, you might as well run Treasury, you might as well run the country. Yeah. Um, I, I think he would be an excellent candidate. Yeah. Who would you put in? I was going to say Sim Shabalala. Okay. Yeah, okay, we'll find some. He's so available. He's got three words now. <laughs> so, so banks, the banks in this country retire execs quite young. He might be available fairly, uh, fairly soon. And I don't know if it's sharing the hot seat with Ben Kruger, um, which was an awkward relationship matter. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to park it there because I'm now standing between you and the champagne and the red wine. Um, I really appreciate AGM, really appreciate my panel this evening. Uh, most of all, appreciate all of you for uh, coming through to the, is this the outskirts of Durbanville? I'm not sure, but whatever it is. I'm, I'm the hills of Durbanville because I'm, I'm from uh, Johannesburg. This is all exotic for me. Really, really appreciate your time, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very, very much.